Okay, shall we start? Anyway, we are, it is uh, 2.55, so let's get started. So uh, today's talk is going to be really interesting because uh, this is about game, right, on the Linux, right? We like Linux and we like game. And we like the nitty-gritty details of Wonderland line, what's going on. And I, my talk has all three components, so it is going to be super interesting. I'm Chang Min from Igalia. And this talk is about the, how to improve the uh, gaming experience on the Linux platform by optimizing and tweaking the processor scheduler, right? So this, talk, uh, this is the outline of the, of the talk. So I will first uh, try to convince you that the uh, gaming on Linux is the something real, that is not a toy, that is a serious job. And then discuss about the, when we actually uh, say that I wanted to optimize the scheduler for the game, what exactly we wanted to optimize, or what metric we need to optimize. So that's the second thing that I'd like to discuss. And the third thing is that the scheduling or the scheduling policy is all about the, the policy. There is, I don't believe that there is a single policy universally works well for entire workload. So it is really important to understand how your target workload behaves. So in that sense that the understanding how the games behave under the hood is that's super interesting and super important in designing and optimizing the scheduling policy. That's the third topic that I'm going to discuss about. And then the lastly, I'm going to present our new scheduling algorithm called uh, LAVD or Latency Criticality Aware Virtual Deadline Scheduling Algorithm. Uh, before explaining that, I will explain the SCAD EXD, which was the uh, briefly discussed uh, this afternoon uh, by John, the, uh, which is uh, still controversial, but that's uh, uh, the framework that we use to develop our new scheduler framework. Okay, let's get started. So Linux Gaming is here today, and if you go, if you visit the Igalia booth on the exhibition part, then you can actually play the Steam Deck. Steam Deck is the something real, and the one of the, and, and I believe that that is the, just the one example. And Steam Deck actually launched the Exodus Windows games, not the Linux games, like uh, the um, uh, minefield, like uh, toy games. This runs the serious Exodus Windows uh, AAA games. And under the hood, it has the AMD APU, uh, customized APU for uh, named AMD Van Gogh. Van Gogh APU is nothing special. It has a, a very good AMD GPU, and also it has a hyper-threaded A-core x86 CPUs, right? Nothing special in some sense. From the so software side, it runs the SteamOS. SteamOS is an uh, Arch Linux-based Linux distribution with a bunch of optimizations for uh, Steam Deck hardware, especially AMD GPU. And also, in order to learn the x86 Windows games, the uh, SteamOS provide a, have a Proton layer. Proton layer is the compatibility layer for Windows games under Linux. And at the core of the Proton layer, the, it has the uh, patched version of Wine for the performance. And besides the Wine, it has a bunch of components, including, uh, especially related to the graphics, including the DX3K, VKD3D, GStreamer, and FFmpeg. That's basically the Steam Deck, and the, the, you can actually play, really nicely play the real Windows games on the Linux handheld device, which is good. But the old problem, when you actually think about the game, game on the PC or game on the P, uh, Steam Deck or any hardware platform, the gaming, right? So people, what people really suffer is that the stuttering problem. So stuttering problem is nothing but the, when you play the game, you are experiencing some micro pauses, which is really annoying. So if you just Google stuttering and game, then you're gonna see the, a lot of the complaints about even after upgrading to my PC, I still experiencing the stuttering problem. What should I do? You can actually see that many kind, uh, that kind of the questions a lot from the, the search engines, right? But they, when you actually uh, first talk to the people that I'm actually optimizing the scheduler to, uh, for, to improve the Linux gaming experience, the first response is that, oh, maybe your uh, approach may be not very successful because the, I know that games are all GPU heavy, right? So if you think about the GPU utilization in the game is the 99%, 95%, of course, that is the game, all the games are GPU heavy, right? Then if we actually upgrade the GPU, all the problems solved? Maybe not. 
the, and my experience is at least maybe not partially that would solve, but the, that is not clearly. The problem is that while the most games are GPU heavy, CPU is still the controller which triggers the GPU job. So if the CPU scheduler do the poor job and making a poor scheduling decision, then GPU will become underutilized and you're gonna see the, uh, a lot of the micro uh, stuttering issues, right? And actually this graph here, actually I ran the same games, right, with the two different scheduler and present the frame per second over time, right? So scheduler A, as you can see here, the frame per second is relatively consistent, right? So the gaming experience is relatively good. But if you take a look at the scheduler B example, right? At some point, the uh, frame per second goes soars up to the 120, and by the very next time, drop down to the five frame per second, right? Then the gaming experience is really poor because the user really suffers from my small micro poses, so the your eyes are really uh, etching, right? So this is not good at all. So the if you ask, does scheduler matter in gaming experience? Yes, it does. Yes, it really seriously does. So, so the, my overarching goal is that the improving the gaming experience in the Linux platform, then the, basically that's the kind of the performance optimization, right? And when you say the performance, right, that means a lot in many different things, right? It could, many, could mean many different things. So what exactly does it mean? So performance, since the performance is could means many different things. So one way to define the performance is the throughput. For example, how many jobs can be done in a given time, that is the definition of the throughput. And latency, which is the time to process a task. In many cases, throughput and latency are tightly related, but if the task stop can parallelly interleave the process, right? So latency cannot, may not be, uh, throughput may not be directly translated into that latency, right? And these days, more important uh, metric would be the tail latency. For example, the, in, in terms of the games, right, latency of the worst 1% or worst 0.1% of the latency is the tail latency. And that is the 99th uh, percentile latency or 9.9 .9 percentile latency. Those are the really, really important metric. That's so why the reason that I'm telling this performance metric is that uh, depending on uh, what optimization that metric that you are trying to so optimize, right? Optimizing strategy could be different, right? So basically, uh, my goal is that try to optimize tail latency, right? Especially from the frame per second point of view without hurting the throughput too much. That's the, my optimization goal. So, so now it's time to a little bit formally define the stuttering problem or the micro jittering or micro poses, right? So the, in the games, fortunately, they have the universal performance metric, which is the frame per second or the frame time. And the average frame per second is basically throughput and the low one percentile, low one percent frame per second is basically 99 percentile tail latency of the frame per second. So my goal is that the uh, improving the low one percent low one percent frame per second, without hurting the average frame per second. So that's the important because that the if the uh, low one percent frame per seconds are low, which means that there could be a lot of the frame per second drops while playing the games that actually hurt the uh, gaming experience and users complain as a stuttering problem. Any questions so far? Okay, so actually I finished the first, uh, uh, try to convince that the game is important uh, on the Linux, not Windows, uh, on the Linux. And uh, we have the performance metric of low 1% frame per second, every frame per second. Now it's time to discuss about the, what is happening uh, under the hood, right? When you actually, what's really happening when you play the games. Right, that is understanding the game workload is really critical because that the, as I said, right, the policy decision is basically the matter of that the how well reflect the actual behavior of the older participants, right? So that, that is the, that's the reason that why the understanding the game workload is really important. And the other one is that if there is some common characteristics of the game, which are different from the other general types of programs in the program domain, then 
we're going to have a chance to come up with some game optimized scheduling policy, right? Then if that scheduling policy will reflect the behavior of the games, right? Then that our schedule using our scheduler actually help to improve the uh, gaming performance a lot, as well as that the somehow workload somehow having the similar property, right? That's the uh, reason that I actually started the workload characterization. So actually, I invested a lot of time. So actually, I collect uh, exactly all scheduling activities while playing the major AAA games on the Steam Deck, Windows games, right? I actually, during my work time, I played the games a lot, right? It was really hard, right? That was a really hard job. <laughs> yeah, joining Alia. <laughs> yeah. So actually, I generated a lot of graph visualizations and the statistical analysis as a result of analysis. So that spent a couple of months. And you don't need to spend that much of time because I'm going to deliver well-summarized my analysis result. First, very interesting thing is that task scheduling and CPU utilization. So when you play the games, right, around 300 tests are involved. And around 90% are long-lived tests. They never terminate, right? Only 10%, like uh, 30 tests are just spawn and terminate while playing the games. So which means that it is very likely all the tests uh, exist entire your game play. Another one is that the 10% the out of 300, roughly uh, 30 tests, are most frequently scheduled tests. They take 95% of scheduling activity. So uh, the other 20, 270 tests are never very rarely scheduled. So the scheduling on the game is a kind of dealing with the scheduling of the 30 tasks, right? And if you take a look at what are the, those 30 tasks, we can actually divide it into the two. One is the roughly half. It's somehow related to the system task, especially the wine, Windows emulation layer, and graphics layer, and audio servers. They take 30, only 30 to 40 percent of the entire scheduling activity, and the other half, like another 50, uh, 50 tasks, uh, gaming game specific tasks. As you know, that the H game engine spawns the thread pool typically, which is the the same as the, your logical CPU cores or 2x of your logical CPU cores, and keep using that, right? So that's very really understandable. They actually incur most of the scheduling activity, like a 60 to 70% of the scheduling activity. That's very really interesting to me. And CPU utilization is moderately high, meaning that it's about 65 to 95, but never reaches to the 100%. Because that the, the, what the game that I test is a pretty well-optimized AAA game, so they are, game developers are kind of genius. They actually made a lot of effort for, for the optimization, so the CPU, 100% of CPU utilization does not make sense in the gaming scenario. So from the scheduler's developer's point of view, that's slightly uh, different because the many scheduler developers uh, has been focused on overloaded scenario. CPU utilization is 100, and we, I have the 4x number of tags that the server can handle. Right, that's the kind of uh, typical scheduler developers are focused on and optimize, and kind of as a corner case, right? So that's the one interesting thing. And more interesting thing is this one. Actually, I was kind of surprised after analyzing this result. So that is about task execution time per schedule. So, so in general, task execution time is really really short. So that is just about 200 or 300 microsecond scale. And even if it, a test, single task runs pretty long, that's just about two or three milliseconds, right? That's a very short comparing to the typical CPU bound operations, right? For example, if you do the GCC compilation or machine learning training or the inference, right? That will take seconds of the CPU cycles, but in the games, they just typically take 200 or 300 CPU cycles microsecond, that's all. More interesting thing is that execution time is very, very stable. And that is very predictable using its average, which means that the same tasks are keep, same tasks keep doing the similar jobs 
over and over and over again, right? So one example is that the wine server, it actually averaged the uh, runtime, execution runtime per schedule is just only 260 microseconds. And one of the games that the task which is spawned by the game engine is takes, uh, typically takes uh, 1.65 milliseconds. So we said there are huge gap. And this graph actually shows the actual uh, average runtime distribution in one game while actually playing the one game. As you can see here, most of the tests are below one millisecond, right? Which is the very uh, interesting. So that actually leads me to the question about if most of the uh, execution time is extremely short, then why scheduling happens that frequently, right? So another surprising uh, thing to me was that preemption takes only 25 to 30% of the entire scheduling activity, which means that preemption here basically means that the time slice is given to the task by the scheduler and time slice exhaustion happens, then the task is kind of kicked out by the scheduler. That's the preemption, right? But that rarely happens. That's just a one out of three, right? And the most of the cases, 70 to 75 of the scheduling is initiated by the calling the waiting system call. Each task actually called the waiting system call, such as EPOL, pipe read, few tag wait, and Unix domain socket read. Then they're going to sleep, right? The caller is going to sleep, waiting for the event, and it is going to be scheduled in when the event is notified. And this is the, actually the, uh, the pie chart distribution. This pie chart actually shows the distribution of the, uh, the, the reasons for the scheduling happens. But as you can see here, the major part is the uh, one biggest part is the preemption, but the, the other rest is about the IOCTA, EPOL, and FUTEC system call, right? That basically means that the tasks are tightly coupled with EPOL, domain socket, FUTEC system calls, right? And also another interesting thing is that the, suppose that the you are call, one task is called the wait system call, right? Then that is going to be wake up in the next time, right? Then is that duration is going to be consistent? That's the, what I defined as a wait time waiting time, and my observation is that each task's wait time is very consistent, right? This graph actually shows that the uh, actual task time distribution in one, when playing a one game. So as you can see here, in case the wine server, each wait time is almost constantly four milliseconds, which basically means that wine server's behavior is nothing but sleeping for four milliseconds and work for 260 microseconds and keep, doing, keep repeating this pattern, right? And if you think about the uh, Chrome browser's main, right? Its waiting time is 15 millisecond, right? S similar, you just sleep for 15 milliseconds, do one job, and then sleep and keep doing this again, right? So that sense that we can actually think about, consider majority of game tasks are periodic task or semi-periodic task, right? So that's the waiting time distribution, and which basically means that the, there are waiters and the wakers, right, in the games, right? And if I actually uh, draw the waiters and wakers relationship as a node, and the waiting system called as edge in the graph, you can actually, I can actually create a huge graph, right? But one interesting thing is that the time most dependencies between the wakers and wakers are very hamper of the task, right? Which basically means that the only few number of tasks, let's say 10 or 15 tasks are very heavily uh, tends to wake or the wake up, right? The other tasks are mostly uh, uh, less the frequently perform the wake up or the, the, the waiting operation. So this upper part of the graph actually uh, shows the, uh, that task relationships in one game and actually represent the video pipeline. So the game tasks are perform their own work for the rendering and then tell to the DXVK the video uh, task 
to the display, and then they, they actually collect the world, the result, and then submit the result uh, through the DXVK submit task, right? So in other words, that in order to update the finish the one job, right? See, all the tasks are in this graph are should be scheduled properly, right? So otherwise, that they will suffer from uh, triggers the uh, the stuttering and the delaying issue, right? And the other part of the uh, the bottom part of the graph is also actually shows the audio pipeline. So the the game actually generate audio that actually go to the the wine purse and the pipe wire layer, and then generate the sound through the uh, yeah through the uh, your speaker or the Bluetooth or headset or the earphone, right? So in summary, many majority of the games are shows the periodic or the quasi semi periodic behavior. That uh, given the fact that task has a stable execution time and stable wait time. Right, that's the one thing, and the other one is that the many of the uh, most of the majority of the work in the games are not just the result of the one single test. They are form a large task graph, and the sequence of tasks should be done properly to finish the one single high level job. Like uh, from the uh, user input to the display update, it, let's say ten tasks are involved in just in finish the one single job. And from the scheduling point of view, right? So the uh, there is a scheduling delay in each and single every steps in among the ten schedule, right? That is going to be accumulated, and that will become the 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 stuttering problem or the micro jittering and uh, lowering the low one percentile frame per second. So that's basically the the summary of my workload study. So any questions so far before? Moving to the, okay, so. Do you think that you would have very similar results for native games? Do you think that the wine uh, layer is making big differences or not? Uh, my answer is no. I think that the, that's just something that I'd like to discuss more broadly, but I think this is a very generic behavior of desktop applications. Actually, I also, use my scheduler on my laptop, not right now, but the usually during my work time, but the, I keep profiling the, this kind of statistics, right? And the graph, and graph shape and distribution and runtime distributions are very similar. But for example, the only difference is that if I, for example, full Linux kernel compile, there will be the task, which has a very long execution time, but Besides that, everything else is very similar because the GNOME shell, KD shell, Wayland, they actually have a very short execution time. They are basically essentially the kind of message louder, right? So their behaviors, uh, behavioral properties are very similar. Any other question? That's a very good question, and I do not have a good answer. <laughs> the reason is that the, I'm mostly focused on the latency uh, jittering by the scheduling. So kind of I kind of have I try to solve all the problem through the scheduling. Of course, that the, I, which basically means that the, even after optimizing the scheduler, there will be the, some latency issues even after the scheduling. And it looks like that there are two major issues are still remaining in the, which cause the stuttering issue. One is that the uh, disk I.O. Because that if you, for example, do the heavy, very complex scene, and the, some of the graphics resources are not loaded and loaded on the fly, that actually causes some micro jittering, which is a little bit typical jitter, longer than the typical jitter. And another one is that it looks like the, some memory compaction related operations happens the background inside the corner also causes some uh, jittering issues, uh, stuttering issues, yeah. But now I'm trying to solve all the problem through the scheduling. That might be the good next subject. Okay, so let's, any other question? Okay, let's move on to the, the second part of the talk. So 
So based on this intuition and observation, so I actually designed the latency criticality aware virtual deadline scheduling algorithm, LAVD, and the, I actually used the uh, SCAD EXT framework to implement the LAVD scheduler, right? So let me first introduce the SCAD EXT. SCAD EXT is the basically a uh, uh, BPF-based extensible scheduler framework which actually enabling, enable the scheduling policy to be implemented in a BPF program. Scheduler developer's point of view, development process uh, procedure with SCAD EXT is somehow similar to the kernel module development. For example, you just write the scheduling policy in the BPF program and compile it and loading into the system. If, if it works well, works well. If it does not work well, kill unloading the your BPF program and re, re we modify your code and keep repeating this process, right? The, so, which is pretty nice, right? Because we don't need a full kernel compilation. And since it is also the BPF program, it inherits all the benefit of the BPF programming. So BPF program basically has a, some notion of a verifier, which verifies that the, you are binary, BPF binary, and tell you that, oh, you have a memory bug. You, have, you are actually rock here, but you do not unrock here, right? And also, you have an infinite loop, potential infinite loop. They actually, if the verifier passes, then which basically means that at least your BPF program does not crash your host, program, host system, right? That's a pretty nice property. So the BPF program actually, uh, SCAD EXT actually enables the rapid experiment with the scheduler. Otherwise, that the modify one line in the head of scat.h header file, fully compile the kernel <laughs> and the rebooting the machine. That takes a lot of repeating cycles, but the, with the BPF, SCAD EXT, rapid experimentation is possible. So no rebooting is, is uh, required and BPF cannot crash the host machine. The worst, the worst thing that scheduler can do is that never ever schedule a task, right? So if that happens, the underlying BPF framework inside, running inside the kernel, they actually run the watchdog task and keep monitoring, the, periodically monitoring that they, there is a hung task or not. And then the scheduler never uh, tasks a certain task more than, let's say, 30 seconds that the underlying BPF framework will unload your BPF the program and revert control back to the default Linux scheduler. So, in, even in the worst case, it's not super terrible, right? And also the SCAD EXT, in order to use the uh, pass the verifier of, for the SCAD EXT, the your BPF should be uh, GPF, follow the GPF version two. So it does not hurt the uh, Linux ecosystem, I believe. And actually the implementing the scheduling policy with the SCAD EXT is a kind of straightforward from the Linux sense, right? So as you know, the Linux is follow the many, adopt the many object-oriented concept through the struct of, this is the same. So the underlying framework uh, define the SCAD EXT ops structure, which is the, defines a list of the function pointers. And basically what you need to do is that the providing the concrete implementation of this particular function pointers. And once you provide all or some of the function pointer implementation using the BPF, right? Then that will become the your uh, scheduler. And the BPF framework and underlying the SCAD EXT framework is going to kind of uh, take a responsibility of the pick up the your BPF program and link your provide the functions into this the function pointer slot. Then core scheduler algorithm we're going to call the necessary callbacks when necessary, right? So for example, if you take a look at here, one of the examples is select CPU. I wanted to uh, execute the task P, right? And, but I have no idea which CPU that I wanted to use, right? Then the underlying framework will call the task CPU callback and the your BPF scheduler make a decision, oh, by the way, the last time task P was executed on the CPU number three, then let's reuse our CPU number three for the cache locality. You can actually make a, that kind of decision and in QDQ and the run stop and yield and SQL related one, all kinds of callbacks are defined. And what you need to do is just provide a concrete implementation for this one. This is the SCAD EXT. 
Let's move on to the core part of the, uh, the talk. And this is the uh, LAVD scheduler, which is the still I'm developing and which is still evolving. So LAVD stands for Latency Critically Aware Virtual Deadline Scheduling Algorithm. This is the new scheduling algorithm motivated by the gaming workload on the Linux. And if I use the BPF scheduler uh, implemented as a BPF scheduler on top of the SCAD EXT framework. And theoretically speaking, the LAVD scheduler is the proportional share scheduler, which basically means that my scheduler, LAVD, is going to respect a nice value and pursue the fair use of the CPU time per nice value. And the other one is that, this, is, as the name implies, this is the virtual deadline-based algorithm, right? So, so deadline, since it is a deadline-based algorithm, so the scheduler essentially have the notion of how urgent it is to schedule a task, a particular task is, right? So the, if the scheduling of a particular task is urgent, its deadline is going to be short and tight. And, uh, but the uh, scheduling of partic another particular task is not that urgent, deadline is going to be long. So the scheduler have uh, some freedom. But please don't confuse that this is not a real-time scheduler, nothing related to the real-time scheduler. So even though you said, oh, I wanted to schedule some particular one, uh, some task in, in one millisecond, there is no guarantee that particular task will be scheduled within one millisecond, right? That, in that sense, this is the virtual deadline-based algorithm, not the work clock-based, real-time-based deadline algorithm. And as the name implies that the, one of the important concepts in the algorithm is that latency criticality. So that is the first class factor in making the scheduling decision. So essence, high level idea is a kind of simple. We know that the, how the game works, right? It forms a large task graph. They are interacting very frequently, right? We're going to somehow model this task behavior from this task graph and use that information to determine latency critically value. And from the latency critically value, we are going to make a scheduling decision, right? That's the thing. And the overall procedure of the LAVD is not much different from the other conventional deadline-based scheduling algorithm. So under the LAVD, runnable task has uh, its time slice and the virtual deadline, which are decided by the scheduler, right? And LAVD scheduler will pick a task which has the earliest virtual deadline the, and allow it to execute for the given time slice, right? So that's the basically how things basically works. But basically, LAVD keep assigning virtual time slice and deadline and then pick the earliest virtual deadline task and allow them for the given time slice. That's the overall procedure. So as you can... Uh, uh, as you can understand, right, the, the core concept is that the how to defining the, the latency criticality, right? Basically, we're going to uh, leverage the uh, test communication and the behavioral property to quantify its uh, latency criticality, as we discussed in the previous slide, like this graph. So for the sake of the, make the, our discussion simple, let's suppose that there are three tasks, task A, B, C, which are coordinated by the waiting system called like an EPO, FUTEC, or Unix domain socket. And task A do something, and then wake up task B, and task B do something, and then wake up task C, right? And in this particular scenario, let's think about how we can define task B's latency criticality, right? So, so the details are complicated, but the high-level ideas are not at all complicated, and that's very intuitive. So let's define the, we define latency B is more latency critical in the following three cases, right? And the first case is very obvious. Task B's runtime per schedule is short, right? Then that is the more latency critical. Suppose that wine task is running for, let's say, 200 microseconds and another task is running for five milliseconds, right? And scheduling delay is the uh, tens of microsecond scale, right? So if the, 
the runtime per schedule is pretty long, like a millisecond or tens of the millisecond scale, right? The scheduling delay is going to be amortized. So that means that the that task, particular task is not latency critical from our sense, from the scheduler's point of view. So the task B's runtime per schedule is short, then we believe that that is the latency critical task. That's the one thing. The other one is that task B wakes task C more frequently, which basically means that task B is going to be the producer of the task C, right, in the task graph, which means that if the scheduling of the task B is delayed, right, scheduling of the task C is also going to be delayed. That's a kind of cascading effect, right? So which basically means that if the task B's frequency to wake up other tasks is high, then we are going to consider that as a latency critical task. Similarly, the other way around, if the task B wait for the task A more frequently, that basically means that task B is going to the consumer of task A's data, right? Consumption speed becomes the slow. That basically means that we'll become bottleneck the task A and task C, right? And if the frequency of the uh, task B's wake frequency and wait frequencies are both are high, that basically means that task B are in the middle of task graph, right? So that are deserved to be treated as a rate latency critical task. That's the three factors are essentially used, collected during the task execution, by collecting the frequency and the average runtime value, and then use these three informations to determine the latency critical value. So this is kind of clear, right? So details are complicated, of course, but the high-level intuitions are clear, I believe. So that latency critical information is used to determine task's virtual deadline. So essentially, the, the more latency critical task will have a tighter and shorter deadline. So the task scheduler can pick such a task more urgently among the other runnable tasks. So once the task deadline is determined, we need to de determine the time slice of the each task, right? So that is going to be uh, this, uh, determined every time that uh, the scheduling decision is made. So somehow the LABD's time slice calculation design is somehow similar to the CFS algorithm. So we have the notion of the targeted latency. Basically, let's say targeted latency is 15 milliseconds. That basically means that I wanted to schedule all the runnable tasks at least once within 15 millisecond boundary, right? And then divide this 15 millisecond uh, equal proportionally to the each task's nice value, right? So everyone can be scheduled at least once. So that's basically how LAVD determined the time slice. Now basically, that's the kind of first way to ensuring the fair use of the, uh, the scheduling. And the second one is that the, even though if we actually proportionally uh, divide the CPU time according to their nice value, the actual use of the CPU time may not be that fair. The, re the reason is that some tasks the, uh, more frequently request the CPU and the other task may slip more frequently, right? So if the LAVD scheduling algorithm find out the overscheduling of the task, right? Then it'll actually uh, slow down the scheduling of such task by artificially injecting some delay, which what it'll call the uh, ineligible uh, duration. So basically, such a differing duration is the proportional to the task's overscheduled time. So this is the overall idea of, of the LAVD scheduling algorithm. And we have been developing uh, LAVD scheduling algorithm for a while. And now we start getting a pretty promising result. It's pretty slightly early that the LAVD is generally better than the default Linux scheduling algorithm, which is LA, uh, EVDF scheduling algorithm. But the, uh, I found that we found that the, in many cases, uh, in most of the cases, LAVD provides better or the similar performance than EVDF, which is the default Linux scheduling algorithm, uh, in terms of the uh, average frame per second and low one percent frame per second. And this is the result of the uh, one of the 
uh, in game, uh, one of the games screenshot. So that game, particular game, provide a, a benchmark inside the game, and I actually ran the uh, benchmark in, with the two different um, scheduling algorithms, LAVD and EVDF, with uh, Linux kernel 3.6.9 RC1. As you can see here, the please be careful that this is the 42, this is the 36, right? So LAVD provide a higher average and a better minimum frame per second. And as you can see here, EVD shows a lot of fluctuations in the frame per second. That actually translates into the micro pose and jittering, but LAVD covers are a little bit more smoother, right? So that's all I have. And you can actually try the LAVD from our GitHub repository, XD GitHub repository. Okay, that's all I have. Any question? Uh, how do you detect if, if the latency between the task changes, like the task ends and another one comes in? Do you re-pull and rebuild the hierarchy between the tasks? Oh, uh, actually, I do not. The uh, I actually did not explain the detail, but the question is that the, if I understand correctly, the question is that did I reconstruct this kind of graph, right, when the new tasks are forked or the existing tasks are terminated, right? So the, one of the challenges in the designing the scheduling algorithm is that the, uh, it should be intelligent enough, but overhead also should be super minimal, right? So in order to maintain the overhead super minimal, right, things should be super simple, right? That's the reason instead of the take care of the everything, I just take care of only three factors, wake frequency, wait frequency, and its runtime. So, and also the uh, more detail, the, actually I maintain these values as a, a, a exponentially weighted uh, runtime average, right? The ex exponential weighted moving average, EWMA, right? So even though tests are coming up and down, right, it is going to be uh, averaged out over time. So, yeah. That's the really good question. The question is that the, how do I test, right? So one of the challenges that I actually first faced is that there is no good benchmark. So it is really hard to run the benchmark consistently. And also the some games fortunately provide the in-game benchmark, which is super helpful. And that is the one major uh, application level benchmark that I use. But that benchmark behavior is also not consistent and deterministic because the game also have uh, some background tests uh, running during running the benchmark. Yeah, but that's a still open question, how to deterministically run the benchmark. But the current practice is that running uh, ab leverage as much as possible the in-game uh, in benchmark and also use some synthetic benchmark like a SCAD bench and NetPerf, those kind of standard scheduler benchmark. Honestly, I do not see the problem. The, my, my, my hunch is that the, because that the, I starting from the game, right? And my core intuition is these three factors, right? So scheduling, execution time is short, and I'm in the middle of the task chain, I should be treated special, right? That's in some sense high level thing, right? That can be applied to, I, th I believe, the, any other programming domains as well. For example, if, it, if I think about the web server design, right? So many web servers has a kind of main task, which actually receives the incoming request, HTTP request, and it has, once the HTTP uh, client connection is established, it actually forks the child process for the security reason, right? So in some sense, this main process is a more late, in some sense, latency critical, right? Scheduling of this guy may be 
delay the other things as well. So I, I guess I actually very carefully guess that the idea can be applied to the uh, other programming domain, other problem domains as well, but I do not have uh, enough evidence because I'm too busy to play games. <laughs> Okay, so if you, oh, question. You mentioned that that graph in GPS data structures, because I imagine that would be quite hard. So I do not explicitly maintain the uh, task graph. So I just the, uh, maintain the each task's run average runtime and wake frequency and wake frequency per task. So. Yeah, so there are uh, other, I actually use the other BPF data structures, but that's mostly the hash table and array. Any other questions? And if you wanted to play with games with me, then please join us, Igalia. <laughs>